welcome to episode 44 of Military Veterans Podcast, where we talk to veterans to learn about their stories and experiences. And today we're joined by Mr. Dinger Bell. Hello, Dinger. Hello. How you doing? I'm doing very well. Good stuff, good stuff. Uh, I just said this to you off air, but uh, saying your name with your surname does ring hey really well. <laughs> the pub um, went down. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that is your nickname right from, from the military times, yeah? It is, it yeah. is. Um, was that like day one basic or something that they gave no, that to you? No, for the first three years I was known as Twink. Okay. I don't understand where that came from. Right. Um, but it, it's, it's, you know, first three years of service, yeah. training, um, that stuck. Okay, okay. Uh, but when I hit the um, the real Air Force, it became Dinger and that stuck. Yeah, fair one, fair one. So um, that's the, pretty much the first time I've said your first name and surname together, as today really is the first time we've met in person. It is. Uh, we've only spoken over the phone. But to get this episode started, um, I will start off with a caveat that we are in your rather large conservatory, which is pretty awesome. But if it starts to rain uh, or, or anything like that from outside... It sounds like a drum roll. Yeah, so we'll see how that goes, but I'm sure it'll be fine. Um, so we've got the four questions uh, at the beginning of every episode as a summary of what we're going to go into. So I will give you a challenge to answer all four at once. Uh, so here we go. What's what? Uh, when did you join the Army? Wrong. The Army? Ah, oh, I'm really losing Royal it right Air Force. Now. Royal Air Force. So when did you join? What service and branch did you join? How long did you serve for and what rank did you get to? Okay, I joined in January 1963 uh, with 180 other boys, 185 other boys. Um, I served for 37 years uh, as an aircraft engineer. Okay. Uh, I started off as an apprentice, but um, where they taught me the job. Cool. Um, and that basically, um, I went up through the ranks to chief technician. Chief technician, brilliant. So RAF, I kind of sport that earlier by uh, <laughs> yeah, that's all right. <laughs> by thinking it is the army. I just speak so much about the army. <laughs> um, but you're not. I'm trying to remember the exact number, but there's not been many RAF people on the show. So I may still have some silly questions. That's um, right. And again, we we spoke off air about your rank you got to, and, and you went through what what that was, and. That's really interesting. So hopefully we'll learn more about that uh, in your episode. Okay. So uh, let, let's let's jump in. Let's uh, rewind the clock uh, and start at the beginning. Uh, where was you born and where did you grow up? I was born in Barnhurst in Kent, um, but lived in Bexley Heath. Um, I had a very good upbringing. Uh, my father was a teacher. My mother was a, a parent. <laughs> she stayed at home and did, it did all the bit. Um I did the normal school route, which is sort of infants, junior, and then into secondary modern school, where my father taught. Okay. That tended to be a bit difficult at times. <laughs> I bet. Um, I was bullied at times when I became top in maths, again in his class because he taught maths. Right. Um, but, hey, I got over that. That's not a problem. Um, but it, it, was, it was a good upbringing. I had a, I had a tremendous childhood. Good, good. And is that one thing you've always been good at is, is maths? No, 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 I'm no. not good at maths. You're not went, good at maths? No, my father slapped me around the head when I got a C grade in GCE. Oh, right. Uh, the one thing I practised time and time again was Pythagoras' theorem. I knew it inside out, back to front, upside down. I knew Pythagoras' theorem until I sat down at the question paper when I looked at this and went, oh, shit. <laughs> it, just, it just left me. Yeah, yeah. And when I, when I, kept, when I went out... Um, my father had already looked at my paper um, and he said, come here. <laughs> so I, I walked up to him quite reasonably happy until he slapped me around the back of the head and he said, why didn't you answer Pythagoras' theorem? And I went, yeah, my mind went blank. Just what happens in exams sometimes, right? <laughs> well, it did at Holton too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so you finished school and then do, do you go on to college or anything like that? No, I didn't. So you, No, you... I wasn't bright enough. Right, right. Um, I literally, um, when I was coming up to leaving school, I was offered, a, a friend of my father offered me a job in the print, e.g. Um, newspaper Newspapers, printing. okay, yeah. Um, and I saw an advert for the RAF apprentice scheme um, and I decided to go for that. And okay. I had the exam for, or the entrance exam for that. Um, in the headmaster in the yeah in the headmaster study at school, obviously I passed it because they accepted me. Right. 
And from there I went to um, the Youth Selection Centre at Cardington, um, where not knowing anything about the RAF, I kept on calling the corporal sir, which annoyed him beyond measure. Um, when I went into the interview, um, it was with the squad leader. I know that now, I didn't at the time. And he offered me three other jobs besides airframe fitting. Right, so what, well, that was what you were going for as an apprentice? As an, uh, yeah, an right. airframe fitter. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, a friend of my... A friend of a friend of my father's who was also a squad leader. I didn't know that at the time either. But he said, whatever you go into, stick to it because they will try and make you go into another branch. Right. Um, so when he started offering things like, um, he, I can only remember two of them, but he offered me three. One was a policeman and the other one was a cook. And I went, no. And I started to push my chair back and he said, where are you going? I said, well, you're not going to giving me the job I've applied for. Therefore, there's no point in me staying here, is there? And he went, oh. Um, uh, so he looked at his paper and he said, we can squeeze you in in January. Okay. <laughs> um, in January when I joined, I was in a room of 18 other lads. There was about seven or eight of us who actually wanted to be airframe fitters. Right. The others wanted to be um, what, what I know as a sooty. It's an engine fitter. Okay. Uh, electricians, instrument fitters. And that was the rest of the other guys. And you think, why do they do this? So that's that my that. introduction yeah. to stupidity of Royal Air Force <laughs> recruiting. <laughs> so before you joined, um, and maybe before you, you saw that advert, did you have any kind of like inkling about the military, about potentially joining or having any interest there? No, um, not really. No. My brother-in-law, who um, was married out in Singapore to my sister... Uh, that's because he was posted there. He was an RAF corporal photographer. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, so, but no, I had no um, no inkling about sort of joining the services. It's just something that stuck in my head at the time. And from I thought, an advert, yeah, go yeah. for it. Yeah, yeah. And do you remember what it was in that advert that kind of like caught your eye? And Not at all. Not, you Not at all. There? No, <laughs> no. I think an apprentice aspect is a sensible thing to go into. Um, the area you went to, uh, just mention that area again. Airframe fitting. Airframe fitting. Um, do you know if that still happens today or is that something? That there still do? is airframe fitters. Yeah. Um, but they're getting few and far between because we're now relying much more on, as far as I can remember, we're relying much more on civilians to do the job. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And getting rid of the RF or getting rid of the um, technical personnel. There are still technical personnel because when a squadron goes abroad, it still needs, and you can't needs make that. civvies go abroad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it still needs um, the trades. Yeah, okay, okay. Now, during your time as an apprentice, do you remember how long that was for? Oh, yeah, three years. That was three years. January 63 to December 65. Okay, okay. And during that time, uh, is it a case of learning the job doing basic or, or how does it work because i'm guessing you go through some sort of training whilst you're there yeah oh yeah very much so um you do a set of uh, there's uh, a school there where they teach you aerodynamics and various other bits and pieces um but in in the hangars um you are taught um how an aircraft is put together and you are able to sort of get your hands on um one one aspect was uh, we were on uh, what they call advanced airframes, and they were using hunters at the time. And what the um, instructor was doing, he, he sort of t took a non-return valve out, turned it round, joined it up again, and we had to find out what he had done. Right, okay. So it was a question of sort of putting the hydraulic rig on and trying to make things work, and everything works except one undercarriage. And you think, okay, Why? So then you start sort of going into the diagrammatics of the undercarriage hydraulic system and you work out. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, a lot of practical work. That's good, that's good. And uh, the people that join the RAF, uh, they, I'm guessing if they don't do apprentice, they go off and do, I'm guessing, basic training? To, oh, yeah, to, yeah, to, very to much so. That. I mean, Swindeby was the main trainer for... Um, how could I say this without being derogatory? Lesser trades, if you like. <laughs> okay. I mean, there was a uh, a chief tech at um, Holton, a guy called Lewis. I thought he was wonderful. 
Um, but he turned round to me and he said, you know, in anything that you do, it's like an arrow. At the pointy end, which is the delivery end, you've got your pilots and your aircraft and your aircraft technicians. In the middle, you've got the shaft of the arrow, which is everybody who is supporting the front end, e.g. your storeman and whatever. And at the back end, you've got the feathers, which are your police um, and your cooks and whatever. The arrow does not go without any one of those. Mm. It needs all three. Yeah. And I've always remembered that um, analogy. Is that the right word? But I've always remembered that. Yeah, that's a good That's a good one to think about because... It doesn't function, like you say, it doesn't go as an arrow if no, that's all right. those three doesn't. areas aren't working it together. Um, and we've got those different areas for a reason, uh, to be one strong unit, I suppose. That's right. One strong that's arrow. right. And I mean, it's the same with any job, really. Mm. If you haven't got the support um, to deliver, you might as well give up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So during those three years, was, was there anything that stood out um, that you remember? Uh, and also... Being caught smoking in bed on a Sunday morning. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Instead of going down to the smoking room. Okay. So, so I got seven days jankers, and then. And what's jankers? Jankers is basically uh, turning up at the guard room with um, kit, brasses, number ones, number twos the next hour, number ones the t- the time after. Okay, it's a smart uniform. Yeah, you're not allowed out. Right, right, right. You know, for seven days. Okay, okay. Um, and annoyingly, on the seventh day. The guy who charged me, the officer who charged me, he was on duty. He said, don't like your shoes, I'm going to charge you and give you another three days. <laughs> so in the end, I need 10 days jackets. And yeah. <laughs> uh, during that time as well, are you doing uh, fitness and things like that? To, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, so there was a sports afternoon and um, I fenced for Halton. Oh, you fenced what, whilst you were there? Yeah. For yeah. those th- In those three years? Yeah. Ah, okay. Have you... Did you do fencing before? Or was I did. I, I did it under a, an Italian called Lagnardo at um, secondary school. Ah, so it's something you you enjoyed. I did enjoy it very much. Great. Did you carry that on, or was that something that you? I was going to when I came out. It wasn't it wasn't done at my first unit, but when I got out to Singapore, I was contacted by a flight sergeant who was an Olympic fencer. He was PTI, um, and he turned around and said, "Would you like to come?" And I said, "Yeah." He said, well, we're having a meeting on such and such a day. Um, come along and see what you think. So I did. And there was a flight lieutenant there who was a ranker, basically. He, As far as he was concerned, I'm the officer, therefore I am IC. My attitude to that was, no, he's an Olympic fencer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He knows what it's about. You and I are just an amateurs compared with this boy. <laughs> and he said, no, I'm, I'm boss, so I want uh, to hell with this. I, I'm not... I'm not joining. Fair enough, fair enough. So you finish the three years there. Um, what do you leave as? A, do you get a rank? I came from out as a JT. A JT. Junior technician. Junior technician. And is that one up from, I mean, what, what what's the equivalent of like private from the army and the RAF? Is it, is it, depending <laughs> it's on very what you're diff- It's very difficult to equate. My brother joined the Royal Navy and he became a chief petty officer. And, there was a certain amount of rivalry. I mean, my father was a wartime soldier, raped in the Navy, I'm in the RAF, um, and um, he turned around quite um, seriously and tried to sort of pull rank on me with, uh, I'm a chief petty officer, I automatically outrank you. And I went, yeah, okay, okay. And I just left it at that. I mean, it, it's very difficult to equate right. one rank from a service okay. to another. But I would imagine that, yes, private... Um, is possibly the nearest thing to a JT. Right, okay. So when you go to be a, an apprentice, like day one, week one, do you have a rank then? No. You don't? Lowest okay. of the low. Right. But <laughs> I'm cannon, <laughs> cannon fodder. But, there's, but there's, there's, there's no rank given to you at that moment as soon as you join? No, right. just, just aircraft apprentice. Aircraft apprentice. And then you leave and you're junior technician. Yeah. Great. So when you leave, um, are you given an opportunity to choose where you would like to head off to, where you want to get stationed? Yes, you are. Um, Some got it, some didn't. I mean, I just left mine blank. It didn't matter where I went. Okay. Um, And I ended up in Stradishall, um, which is in East Anglia. Now Her Majesty's prison, Pierpoint. Right, right. Okay. His Majesty's now. His Majesty's big run, yeah. We've got got to get used to that, haven't we? Yeah. Um, (laughs) So you didn't mind where you went 
at that time, because you said it's 65, is yeah. that right? Is there a lot of stations around the world that you could get sent oh, to? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because it's quite a busy uh, Yeah, busy I mean, time, we had but... five or six in the Middle East. Right, right. But you didn't mind. You just wanted to go wherever. Yeah, I mean, they, 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 there's no way you get sent abroad unless your parents are abroad. Right. Straight out of Holton. You, okay. li- you literally hit the UK. Uh, it might be Lossy Mouth in Scotland. It, it, you know, it might be Chivener or uh, wherever down here. Okay. You know, it, it really didn't matter, but they tended to keep you um, in the UK to for start the first with. couple of years. Right, right, right. Oh, interesting. So mention the first location again. Stratishaw. Stratishaw. Um, how did you find it and how long was you there for? Um, I was there for 66 to 67, January 66 to October 67. Okay. When they put me on um, PWR for Singapore. Well, at least the far, they asked me where I wanted to go and I said Singapore. Um, where else did I go for? I can't remember the other choices. But anyway, I put down three choices um, and I ended up in Singapore for three years at RAF right. Tenga. But after you've been there for that, that short period of time. Yeah, yeah. But um, about what, sort of 20, 20, 20, about 22 months. Yeah. How did you find that time? Great. You enjoyed yeah, it? I mean, good learning. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What stands out to you? <laughs> the first thing that stood out was the fact that the, I was put onto the first line, which is basically um, putting petrol into a car. You know, all you were doing was filling them up with oil and, and whatever. And the first job I had was um, filling the Varsity engine, petrol, petrol-driven petrol engine, filling it up with oil. And the guy they got to teach me was what... The, I mean, it's, it's a defunct rank now, but he was a TAG, Trade Assistant General. It means that he could have gone in, uh, been a guard room runner, he could have gone into the um, cookhouse, um, he could have gone on the first line... He could have been a sweeper. He, he was just no trade at all. He was just one of these gash people you pick up and there's your job, go and do it. And I was most put out by the fact that here I am, three years as an apprentice, coming out as a JT, and I've been given a TAG to show me how to re-oil an aeroplane. Right. And I thought, huh, <laughs> this can't be right. But anyway, we got on very well. Okay, good, good. And so you get Singapore and you head out there, right? Yeah. Um, what... Was that the first time you've been away, like away from the UK? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. How did you find that? What was your mindset? I'm very easy on travelling. I always have been. Um, that's why I say, you know, when I came out of Halton, it didn't matter where I go. I mean, yes, as much as I had a, a, an exceptionally good family life at home, it really didn't bother me being, you know, leaving them behind. It, it never did. Yeah, okay. Um, if that makes me strange, then I'm strange. <laughs> Um, anything stand out for you when you got to Singapore for the first oh, time? Oh, yeah, the size of the cockroaches. The, the cockroaches? <laughs> Jesus, they were big. I mean, you could have strapped a five, five-inch gun on the back of them. Some of them. Blimey. They were massive, <laughs> two, three inches long. And how was it out there? How long was you out there for? Three years. Three years? Three years, about yeah. that. Um, from October 67 to March 70, so. Okay, yeah, 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 nice. Um so what was you doing whilst you're out there? Why, why did we have Singapore a Singapore station? Singapore was made up of um, three three RF units. One was Changi, that was the main transport uh, transport um, hub, if you like. That's where the VC tens and the Hercules went into. Um, I went to Tenga onto uh, a Hunter Squadron twenty. Um, a Salita was alive, I think, when I got out there, but that died a death. Uh, while I was out there, I think. And what's that? Salita was another RAF station. Oh, was it? I okay. don't know why right. we had more than um, two, but hey. Yeah. And what was you working on? Obviously, hunters. You're working on hunters. Yeah. And for anybody that's not aware of what hunters are or were. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> no, oh, there's still some air forces that are flying them. Um, it's a single seat fighter. Um, at the time, it was the most heavily armed fighter in the world. Oh, interesting. With four 30 mil cannon. Um, firing sort of straight out the front. Um, the pilots loved it. The ground crew loved it. It, it was just a nice aeroplane. And and as a junior technician, what what's your role with those uh, aircraft? Well, I started off in the hangar, uh, which was basically fixing them. Okay. You know, the pilots take them up, they break them, they come back down, <laughs> <laughs> the, the ground crew fix them. Um, 
I took my corporal's exam out there and I got my tapes up. Okay, uh, so it's junior technician to corporal. Corporal, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and they put me on the line, uh, which, as I said before, is basically sort of filling them with air and oxygen and a uh, few packing parachutes. Okay. So you need some, like, responsible person to do that, right? Because it's oh, quite yeah, important. Yeah. So that's why I guess corporals are doing well, it. Well, I was running the line at you the time. The line. So, okay. you know, I had sort of a, a, a small team under. Good, yeah. But it was good fun. Yeah. Um, I made the airfield black for about two hours. Um, we had a hunter that slid off the runway and went into the monsoon ditch. And to get it out, I mean, this thing weighs seven tonnes. To get it out, you need bowsers and cables and, and you have to winch it out a bit slowly to try and not to damage it anymore. And the engineering officer out there at the time, a guy called Finney, um, he wanted to come out and see how it was done. So I said, yeah, that's fine. This is as a corporal. Um, so I said, yeah, okay, fine. So he came out. Um, when you're pulling any aircraft out of a ridiculous situation, the stress that is on the hawsers, their metal hawsers, is phenomenal. You do not stand anywhere near them because if they do snap, they'll take your head off. It's yeah. no argument about it at all. And this guy, Finney, um, decided he wanted to stand between the two cables that were pulling the hunter out. And I went, no, 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 stop. Um, and he said, why? And I said, because you're standing between them. You have to come back behind the bowsers. And he said, no, I want to see what happens. And I went, no. Now, this is me talking to a flight lieutenant. Very difficult, except that I am a bullshit bastard. <laughs> um, and he turned around and he said, no, this is where I'm staying. I said, not what I'm wedging. And with that, I turned around to the crew and I said, right, let's go back to the hangar. And I took the whole bloody lot back to the crew room where we sat down to have a cup of coffee about 30, no, a minute and a half later, there's this burr, 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 and into the, crew, into the crew of Storms the Group Captain. Where's the crash team? And I sort of stood up and I said, well, that, that will be me, sir. And he went, um, why aren't you pulling that aircraft out? So I tried to explain. He said, get your ass out there, Bell, and get that aircraft out of the ditch. And I said, sir. And see me tomorrow morning in my office at 8 o'clock. So I said, oh, okay. So I dressed up in number ones and, and sort of went to his office. And he said, right, now tell me the story. So I told him the story. And he said, one, two things. One, you don't argue with an officer. The second, don't ever do that to my airfield again. Thirdly, how do you take your coffee? <laughs> and he sat down and we talked about it in very civilised terms. The next thing I knew, I was sort of being dismissed, but Finney was in the outer office and he and I then didn't get on very well for mm. the rest of the tour. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a lot of things like that, um, kind of an officer trying to take take over? Not often. Um, not often, no. no. not often. Normally, you know, it, it's like anything. As I said to you earlier on this morning, um, I defer to experience. I okay. always have. It doesn't matter what rank you are. You know, if an LAC knows more than I do... I will listen to him yeah, because yeah. how else do I learn? Um, but no, it, it um, very rarely happens. Most officers are, or most senior NCOs, turn around and, and tend to accept that sort of situation. Fair enough, fair enough. You so can't know everything. I guess you got the hunter out and then you uh, fixed it. So. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it went into the hangar. It got all the mud and um, crap rocks off, off, off its legs. And, yeah, yeah. Um, there was no structural damage into the wing or anywhere oh, else, so good. we were lucky. That's good. And it was sort of back on the line in about two days. Yeah, nice, nice. So anything else from Singapore you want to share before you then go somewhere else? Well, um, we had <laughs> another bit of a frack. Um, same engineering officer when he sort of put me in charge of painting all the ground equipment blue. Okay. Yeah. Don't understand why. It doesn't matter. Right, right, right. Because they're all yellow <laughs> now, I think. Um, no, they're not. They're all olive green. But they were they were coming from yellow to blue. I don't know why, and it matters not really, but we painted everything blue, including the engineering officer's bike. Saddle, brakes, chain, the whole thing was blue, and he blew up. Okay. <laughs> he, he was not happy, man. That's fair, that's <laughs> fair. So finishing off in Singapore, um, is it, again, you, you get to choose where to go, uh, or, or is it because... 
it's time yeah, no, for promotion. Um, I mean, each no, each time you um, each time you're posted, you're given a choice. You no guarantee you're going to get it, but you are given a number of choices. Uh, okay, uh, normally three, um, and I chose Chivna, um, and that's where I came back to again back on Hunters. For obvious reason, when you think about it, I mean, having sort of learned about hunters out in Singapore for three years, you're not going to then go sort of. I want to try another aeroplane. The answer is no. I know hunters. Yeah, yeah. Let's go for it. That's fair. Uh, interesting that you get like multiple choices. Um, we don't. Uh, army no, wise, no, that's right. We, you don't. We get told where to go. Yeah. So interesting. And are you still classes? I know you've gone up to corporal, but are you still classed as a junior technician, or have you now got a bit of experience under your belt, and therefore you're seen as a higher level technician that's right uh, to, to an extent with um jt you are just a worker um all right you know a fair bit but you're just a worker as corporal you are then or you can be put in charge of a small team um and when i say small i mean on the line it can sort of be quite a lot of people um but nevertheless the work is small because okay. all you're doing is seeing an airplane in rearming it re-oiling it refueling it and then you're seeing it off sort of an hour, hour and a half later, and that's all you're doing. So, you know, it, it's not uh, – there's no real hardship in, in the work. Mm -hmm. So a corporal can handle that sort of team. Okay. So next location, say it again. Chivener. Chivener. North Devon. North Devon. I was going to say that that is UK. So you did you want to come back to UK? Oh, yeah. You did. Well, I mean, I haven't got a choice. Oh, okay. end, end, end of Singapore, you're coming back to the UK. I right. Mean, so you can't go from a overseas to an overseas? No. Right. No, so we're, we're civilised in the RAF. You know, we, we allow <laughs> people to come home. <laughs> Fair enough. So you come back there. Um, is it, you mentioned about working on the Hunters again. Um, is it a case of just carrying on working on the Hunters or do you have other other jobs now starting to come no, into No, no, I, I, I joined a team. Uh, the sergeant uh, was a, a cracking man, a bloke called Parrington. Um, used to chase me around the hangar about once a week because I used to walk in in the morning and kiss his head. <laughs> <laughs> he was very bald. Uh, but he knew his stuff. I mean, he once um, drew a valve that I was asking how it worked and he once drew it on the back of a fag packet and showed me how it worked. He knew his stuff, did Jack Parrington. Uh, but he was also a boozer and a womaniser. But he was a cracking man, you know, as a team leader. And I worked with... I showed you Dave Watkins earlier, my best mate, and we've been mates ever since then. Um, made quite um, our, our claim to fame was having a hunter come in on a Friday afternoon. Um, we jack it up, or no, Friday morning, jack it up, um, blow the undercarriage down, which means basically the emergency undercarriage. You're putting air into a hydraulic system. So, um, it, it is an emergency system and, and you drop all the um, uh, undercarriage um, you connect a hydraulic rig and then at dinner time this is, this is uh, um, something that sort of the army have never understood dinner time the RAF packs up on a Friday afternoon you know down a pub and the first time it happened to me um, was the first Friday I was there and Watkins and, and Pasco and Dean all, all went down to the Black, Heart, uh, Black Horse in um, Braunton. And we started sort of drinking and I sort of turned around at about sort of five to one, ten to one, said, come on, let's go back. No, 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 let's have another pint. And I said, no, let's go back. And I, I started to get a, well, a little bit shirty because I didn't know the routine by then. Uh, and I said, no, look, we're going back. And they said, no, 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 have another pint. And just as I was really going to get start to get sort of, you know, tapes, I'm pulling rank, let's go back. In comes the sergeant who says, where's my pint? <laughs> <laughs> and I then was let into the fact that they didn't. this team didn't work on a Friday afternoon. Fair enough, fair enough. But we still got the aircraft out on time, which is basically all they were asking for. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and to help with time frame, how long are you there for? So what, what's the what's the years that you're, you're there? Um, March 70 to september 73 okay so just over three years yeah yeah and whilst you're in these different locations you don't go anywhere else do you you're just there so obviously 
I don't know if it's different in this day and age, but like if if I'm stationed in Germany, I might get sent to Afghanistan. Or okay. Oman when I was at something. Spanish All on Bastards, I did a long weekend in uh, Malta. Right. It, Spanish All was navig- navigational training. Okay. So what they used to do is about once a month, no, once every three months, they used to take sort of half a dozen aircraft, fly them out to Malta. Okay. Letting the student navigator get you there. Um. So I spent a long weekend. I can't remember any of it. Okay. <laughs> um, I remember getting back on board on the Monday morning and um, there was a master pilot called Jock Dunbar. Um, it's the second time that I um, can mention him, actually. But uh, the second time that I mentioned him was basically uh, he missed his footing coming up the steps because he was still blotto. He was still drunk, and it, this is the pilot of the aeroplane, you know, and he's well out of it. I mean, he missed the footing, he threw his bag up, and missed that, and it fell back down onto the ground, and he, uh, he just a little bit pimpled. <laughs> and he, he sort of uh, got in, we took off, and he put the throttles fully forward. He says, we're going home. <laughs> and uh, we got home okay. well, about half an hour before everybody <laughs> else. So whilst you're there... Um, are you looking at being promoted again or is it just getting experience under no, your belt? No, um, I went from there to Gottesloe in Germany. Um, oh, after three years? Yeah. Oh, so another post in... Yeah. Okay, to Gottesloe, right. Um, and that's where I put my third up. Okay, okay. But at Chivna, no. Uh, I worked in the hangar for a certain amount of time. I was then put on the line for a time um, and I then went out um, back on back into the hangar. Okay. Anything stand out from you whilst you're at Chivener? Um <laughs> Yeah, there's a couple of things. There's a um, a tube of rubber solution called Bostic 1790. And it was a well-known sort of trick of the riggers that if you found a cut tyre, you sort of got this tube of Bostic 1790 out of your pocket and you squeeze this 1790 into the tyre and then you roll the aircraft forward so that it couldn't be seen by the pilot on his inspection, but it vulcanised <laughs> itself on takeoff. Okay. So it came back and it didn't matter where you looked, you could not find this cut anywhere in the tyre. Okay, okay. Um, on, on, I'm going to ask a question on that. Did you, as a technician, did you change tyres? Wheels, tyres, yeah, yeah? What, and brakes. What's that like? Because is that difficult? Like you have to jack up the whole freaking no, plane? No, 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 no. You, 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 you jack up one side only. To the so, so the wheel is off the ground. Okay. Um, remembering this is very very hot because he's only just come back. Uh, if if you have to do a brake change, that's that's even hotter because you're then wearing gloves and and various other things to get the brake rings and brake pads off. So do you have to do all this when it lands. Yeah. Or, or, so yeah. That... I mean, you don't often do a brake uh, brake change after a landing because normally you look at brakes on a yeah. a BF at the beginning of the day and you say that'll last the day. Right, right, okay. So first thing tomorrow morning, when everything's cooled down and whatever, you, you do that's that. when you do the brake yeah, change. Yeah, yeah, okay. So you, uh, jack, you jack up one jack side. Jack up one side till the tyre is off the ground by yeah. about half an inch. Um, undo a grub screw, undo the wheel nut, pull the wheel forward, get the new one. And put it on. And show okay. it on. What about the one at the front, under the nose cone? Same thing. How do you jack that, or is it... Is it got two wheels side by side? No, no, it's only one wheel. Right. On, well, on a Hunter, it's only one wheel. But you just jack up. You just jack it up the same the, way. From yeah. the arm, I'm guessing? Well, no, for, from the wheel axle itself. Free, okay, okay. Or you get a nose jack, which, which is basically, I mean, still, it's, it's the same thing. You you just jack it up until the wheel is about half an inch off the ground. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> but you very rarely change a nose wheel. Oh, okay. Pure, I mean, it doesn't wear out as much as the... Um, the mains, purely and simply, because one, the mains are there to sort of do the landings and all the rest of it, so they get scuffed a lot, and the nose is held off. Until the last minute. Until or, the last yeah. minute, when you can't hold it off anymore, it Fair just enough. drops down then. Mm, okay, okay. Uh, you said there was going to be another one. Uh, yeah, I was, on, I was on crash crew one night, um, and an aircraft sort of brake failed, and it took the barrier, which is a net at the end of the runway. Um and um, the warrant officer in charge um, sort of got the crash crew together and we all sort of legged it out there. And all of a sudden, sort of around us, is the wing commander flying, the group captain, uh, 
there were a couple of other officers as well. And they started sort of saying, you know, why didn't you do this? Why don't you do that? And the warrant officer turned around and said, do you want to take over this crash crew, sirs? Or are you going to bog off and leave us alone? <laughs> and they sort of looked at him and the group team captain said, you know, uh, Mr. I can't remember his name, doesn't matter, Mr. So-and-so, can I see you tomorrow morning? And the warrant officer said, by all means. No trouble at all, sir, but will you go away now? <laughs> um, so the officers all left and we got it out of the barrier and took it back. Fair, fair. Sounds like there's a lot of, uh, there's lots of different things happening from, you know, as simple as, a simple, I say simple with, with air quotes, um, as changing a wheel to sorting out a vehicle, uh, an aircraft that's gone offline. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Um, cool. Um, I'm, I'm just going to say we're going to have to reduce the amount of tapping on on table just Sorry. because that will be difficult and and hard to. to yeah, no, I, I'm um, conscious when I did it. It's, it's easy when you when you uh, kind of get into a story. Um, but let's carry on with uh, the likes of getting to Gutterslow. Was you looking forward to going to Germany uh, as a posting? Yeah, I mean, uh, I went out there three months before my family joined me, so I was. Uh, um, well into sort of where the pubs were and everything else by the, <laughs> by the time they came out. Um, I was going on to helicopters. I'd done a course at Westlands on the Wessex before going out there. Okay. Um, I have to say that from that course, and I couldn't get off it, but from that course, I did not like helicopters. No? No. What, what, I mean, what, what was the reason? Um, complicated, noisy, um, Description of a helicopter is basically a million and a half rivets flying in noisy, noisy formation. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, and that, that just about sums helicopters up, really. Uh, but I enjoyed my time. I mean, we went out on exercises and, and um, various time, you know, sleeping under tents. and out, out in Germany? Yeah. Yeah, very much so. Whereabouts did you do that with the RAF? Did you go down to... The likes of Senlager or...? I think we went close to Senlager. I can't tell you where. No. Uh, one of the times was up in um, up in the mountains uh, near Munich. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, I did a detachment to with the border patrol, you know, the east-west border between the two, mm. um, and they have to sort of... There's parts of it that you can't see without... Uh, because you can't... There's no roads. So basically they um, get the helicopters up there. Uh, we did no flying at all because of the weather. Okay. We were up there for five days. Um, it's the only time I've ever had curry and beer for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> and it was bloody good. <laughs> that was in a German mess. Um, yeah, it was fun. I nearly got taken out uh, coming back from Oslo. We nearly got taken out by a starfighter at okay. F-104. Go on, can you share? Uh, well, I, I was lying on the back. With a um, set of earphones on. What was you in? A Wessex. A Wessex, okay. Yeah. Um, maximum speed about 80 knots, 85, 95 miles an hour. And I'm just lying there sort of generally trying to get some more sleep. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> in my earphones, is this very loud shouting, break, break, break. Uh, and I'm thrown to the floor because I haven't got a seatbelt on. I mean, why would you need one? Um so I was thrown to the floor and I went, what the effing hell's going on? And the pilot turned around and said, sorry about that. He said, we just nearly got taken out by a starfighter, <laughs> which was being driven by uh, a German pilot. Wow. Um, and all three uh, Wessex just went left, right, and up and down and wherever. And I ended up with a bruised knee on the floor of the bloody <laughs> aeroplane. <laughs> but anyway, that was one of those things. Did you strap yourself in from then on? No, <laughs> no. I mean, it, it didn't get to happen again, did it? Well, yeah, one hopes not. You hope not. No. So you mentioned about getting your third stripe, is that right? Yeah. Um, whilst you're out there. Do you have to do any, like, special courses to get these extra ranks or is it just time served? No, I had to um, I had to pass an exam. Um, again, far deeper than the one I passed at Halton. Uh, corporal was automatic because of the... the, the um, the marks I got at Halton on my final exam. So that okay. that was automatic, Corporal. But I had to pass another exam, trade exam, to get my third up. Okay. And, and are you learning more to, with your trade? Are you going away to do extra courses to like... No, no, no. Just, this is just purely learning. out of books. Okay, out of the books. I mean, and there were two of us doing it. He was going for his chief and I was going for my sergeant. 
and we were good mates. Uh, wives were good mates as well. So he and I just got together at night um, and just ploughed through the books. Okay, yeah. And he passed and I passed, which was good news. Excellent, excellent. Um, was there only one type of aircraft then, one type of helicopter that you were working on? Out there, yes. Out there, yeah. okay. Did you have quite a big fleet or was it uh, fairly small? There must have been about 14 aircraft. Oh, okay. That sounds healthy to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, about 14 aircraft. Um, major cock-up, I suppose, was um, killing five blades all in one go, five helicopter blades. All right. um, they were German hangars, and they open at the front. English hangars open at each end. Okay, yeah. German hangars open all the way across the front. Um, and there's a lip where the hangar door, a rail, where the hangar door sort of slides along and all the rest of it. And you try and take it very, very carefully over this hump because you jump down into the hangar. And I wasn't quick enough with the blades because th they were intermeshing. So what, folding into each other? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Like, like a Chinex blade, only slowly... Yeah, because you were trying to get them so that uh, the next morning all you had to do was to get them out and do a quick BF and, and the aircraft could go. So you didn't fold the aircraft. Um, and I wasn't quick enough with the blade. And sort of one blade hit another on another aeroplane, which then moved that rotor, which then hit another blade and wrote another two off. So <laughs> I rang the flight down and I sort of explained it to him. Um I won't call, say what he called me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let your imagination run with that one. Uh, but the next morning, we changed five blades. What's that like? <laughs> Hard work. <laughs> do you have, is it, is, it, is it kind of like hands-on or do you have like a little crane thing that lifts them into place? Like how does that work? With no, a... no, no, it's, it's hands-on. It is hands-on. It, yeah, it, it's lift, um, very heavy lifting. Uh, um, these things are not lightweight and they're awkward. Um, you've got two pins that go through the head that hold the blade on. Um, you put the bottom pin in first, then somebody with the blade lifter lifts the blade from the outside and then you slot the top pin in. Okay. So I'm guessing it has to be sort of level, right, to go in and get those pins yeah, aligned. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So we've changed the tyre. <laughs> we've changed the blade. Um, yeah, interesting, interesting. Now, you've mentioned a couple of times BF. Before flights. Before There's flights. three servicings for... Um, an aircraft to to go flying it's the the before flight which is basically when you're um just checking up um that you've got enough oxygen in the airs are done that the fuel is topped up and the tires and everything else is okay the pilot then comes around and does a pre-flight before he goes up and all he does is just a quick walk around just to make sure that all the panels and everything else are done up um when it comes down if it's flying again you do a thing called a turnaround Okay. Which is just refueling. Right, right. Um, and then at the end of the day, it's um, basically an after flight when you literally sort of look at everything, um, engine intakes, um, jet, uh, jet, you know, the jet, uh, jet pipe itself, all that sort of thing. Um, and anything that needs doing, you do. So that's all down to you and your team? Um, yeah, the line team. Yeah, yeah. First line team. It does sound like a cool job. <laughs> I was just oh, say. It's, a, it's a great job. It's a great job. I loved it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like, I've seen uh, on some helicopters, they've had the blades kind of held down with some sort of uh, attachment. Yeah, that's folding the blades. Folding the blades. Right. Is that to protect it whilst bad weather is in? Well, it just means for better storage. I mean, the, Navy had, the Navy had the Sea King, which was um, five blades. And they managed to fold all theirs, but then they had to get theirs down, if you think about it, into the hangars below decks. Mm, fair point, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and they very rarely left them upstairs, except in, um, you know, places where there's you guarantee good weather. Mm. But, if it, I mean, if a school turns up, you need to get these things down and under. Okay. So all five blades are folded in one way or another just to get them into the hangars. Yeah. And how many blades are on your aircraft? Wessex four. Four. Okay. Okay. How many tail blades does it have? Four. Has four as well. Okay. Are they easier to change? 
Yeah, much. <laughs> much. <laughs> so, what, like, what would cause damage? I mean, you mentioned about, like, going to a hangar, but it, 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 would it be a bird strike or...? Oh, yeah, a bird strike or you come down in a, an enclosed space where, I mean, um, most of the blades we changed were either out of hours, e.g. shelf life. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, or um, had hit twigs or trees or... Right. Uh, or had blown something up off the ground because you get an efflux. Yes, yeah. Um, so it may have sort of lifted a branch off off the ground and it then comes back down through the rotors. Okay. What, what, what about the main body? The main body's quite quite durable or did you have to change a lot of, I don't know, windows? We had a naval <laughs> detachment come out. I don't know why, I can't remember. Um, but we were, they were asked to, could we hang them in your hangar? And we said, yeah. Uh, and they were emphatic that it wasn't to be folded, but the tail the tail can fold. Um, and I grabbed hold of the handhold of the Wessex, their Wessex, and it literally came away in my hands. Ooh. I mean, it literally came away in my hands. Um, the squadron leader, no, not squadron leader, the, the commander of the detachment, uh, he wanted to be charged. Uh, for causing damage. Bert Goff, my flight sergeant out there, turned around and said, I will charge him, uh, but if I charge him, you will find somewhere else to hang your aircraft. Fair. Uh, this commander, I'm a commander. Sir, they're my hangers. <laughs> um, so basically what happened was the fact that they got a repair scheme out of it. Um, the civvies who were at, because it was only... Um, it was only naval pilots that were flying them, but they had a civilian um, servicing team. And the civilian turned around and said, we're so glad you did that. <laughs> and I went, why? And he said, because we've had to change the panels all the way from the back end to three panels up. They were corroded. Oh, really? And they could have gone at any time where we lose the whole helicopter. Bloody hell. He said, all you've done is find the corrosion. Yeah. Thank you. But I mean, the commander wasn't happy. Yeah, yeah. Can't please everybody. No, you can't. You can't. <laughs> so your time in Gutslow, I yep. guess, comes to an end. Uh, you've you've picked up another another stripe. So now a sergeant. Um, do you then get another bunch of choices of where to go next? Yeah. 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 Um, when I got my third up, uh, you get introduced into the mess by all the senior NCOs that you're working with, and uh, yeah, you you get pretty bladdered. <laughs> Um, Especially in Germany with cheap, yeah, cheap well, beer. exactly. So, <laughs> I they they get me home. My car's still at, at, on the camp, but they they get me home, and um, I go to bed because I am bladdered. And I wake up. Uh, it's eight o'clock on the uh, bedside clock. I jump out of bed, leg it into the living room, start giving my wife, holy hell. I'm going to be late for work. Why the hell didn't you get me up? She's looking at me gobsmacked as if I've got two heads. Yeah, she said, you do realise it's eight o'clock at night? <laughs> and I went, ah, <laughs> apologies. <laughs> I'm guessing it was an afternoon. Oh, session. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it, it went on till about four o'clock in the afternoon and then they, they got me home. Bloody hell, bloody hell. So where did you have to head off to after Guttersloe? After Guttersloe, it was Broadie. Brawley? Brawdy. Brawdy. B yeah, B-R-A-W-D-Y. Okay. It's in South Wales. And what year is this? Years. Um, January 76 to September 76. Oh, okay, so short stint. Yeah, my marriage broke up. Ah, okay. She okay. went off with another fella. Right. Who right, I thought right. was a mate, but obviously misguided. <laughs> yeah, it happens, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does, it uh, does. In the military, for sure. Um do you want to gloss over that or do you want to talk about no, the, no, the on actual... No, no, on the contrary, uh, as I say, there, there's nothing that um, I, I, I won't answer it. Because so, um, it's Wells. Um, is it aircraft there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, they were hunters at the time. Hunters at the time, okay. Um, I was picked up out in Singapore and in um, Chibna. Uh, there's a thing called a starter box uh, which initiates everything. The pilot presses the tit. And all sorts of things happen, but the starter box is where all the contacts and, and electrical gubbins works to make things happen in the right sequence. And it's a, it's on a drop-down panel, and in 
Singapore and in Chibna, uh, if the thing goes uh, we and nothing happens, you go forward, you kick the box. If it does it a second time, you undo a screw of the box, allow it to sort of get atmospheric pressure because that could be the reason. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but you kick the box first to sort of loosen the valves. Works. Okay. Believe me, it works. So we get to, um, I got to Broadie and I'm put on the line. Great job. Loved it. Plenty of pressure um, and lots of fun. Good team too. Um, and this guy came in. He said, it won't start. I said, yeah, it will. And I went out and I grabbed hold of the uh, back end of the, um, where, where the panel goes, lifted my feet, kicked the box and said, try it now. It went. I walked back in. The squad leader went absolutely birds working. We don't start aircraft like that, Chief. No, Sergeant. And I went, sorry, sir, how long have you done on Hunters? And he went, well, this is my first tour on Hunters. And I said, well, I've done seven years. So <laughs> let's have the experience first, shall we? And he said, but it damages the stuff inside the box. I said, no, it doesn't. It allows the aircraft to start. So he and I weren't really going to get on very well. That was in the... Beginning part, was it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fairly early on. Um, they were phlegms, flight line mechanics. Um, and instead of being technicians, they were brought in purely as garage attendants. Okay. Okay. I've, I found it disgusting, quite honestly. Uh, they were promised the earth. They were promised that after two to three years that they were going to give or be given their fittest courses and uh, all the rest of it and become tradesmen. Uh, it never happened. There was a guy I joined up with called Bill Ray. He and I were on the same shift. And he and I were, yeah, I can say instrumental in getting them their fittest courses and whatever. They didn't all ha get a chance to go. Um, but we were, we, we shouted and railed and, uh, we, you know, we, we talked to the group captain, we talked to wing commanders, um, and in the end, the RAF did start sending the Flems away for their fittest courses, but it shouldn't have taken that. I mean, mm. again, it goes back to sort of trying to pass me off as a policeman or, or yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, it doesn't work. You yeah. know, you don't promise people something and then not deliver. So when you're there, um, you said it's, they started off with hunters. Did they... Did they change aircraft or? My second tour back, yeah. They, oh, okay. they went on the Hawks, on. yeah. Right, right, okay. Um, so where did you go after after that first short tour there? Well, because my marriage broke up yeah. and because the guy she was going off with was a chief tech going to get his flight sergeant. Right. I turned around and said, right, I'm not going to bugger his career up. I'll move. Okay, okay. It's nice of you. So um, I disappeared to Odium. Okay, yeah. Okay. I think it was Odium. Yeah, Odium. Yeah. Um, I went into End Records at Odium, which is basically um, making sure the paperwork for the aircraft is all sort of tickety-boo and all the rest of it, log cards for uh, various things. Okay. What, just for Odium? Or, or oh, for, yeah, no, just for Odium. Just for Odium, yeah. okay. Uh, is, is that one of the bigger stations, Odium? Helicopter-wise, yes. Right, okay. I mean, at the moment, it's got Pumas, Chinooks, I don't even know. I don't think they've got any more Wessex. Uh, but I think uh, it was it was big. The army use it a lot. It's very it's very close to Salisbury Plain. Yeah, yeah. It's just um, just to the side of Basingstoke, and about uh, a mile south of the M3. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but the, the army use it a lot. Okay. Purely and simply because it's very close to Salisbury Plain. Yeah. So that role you were doing there sounds quite important just to make sure things are all well, ticked it, off. And it was. Um, but a little bit different than changing it, place. Yeah, <laughs> it was in an office. Um, I, I, I don't work well in offices. Mm. You know, I, I prefer um, the hustle and bustle of uh, sort of actually being on aeroplanes and uh, and generally sort of making decisions at the, you know, in an office. Yeah, you're yeah. not making decisions. You're just literally sort of, oh, yeah, it's another log card. Yeah. Because at this point, how long have you been in? So you joined in 63... Oh, well, 63 I joined. Yeah. So I came out into the Air Force in January 66. It's now set uh, 76. So I've been in 10 years. Yeah. 
So a decade and you you've been on the on the on the on, line. On, online and in hangar, yeah, generally yeah. getting so it's quite yourself a dirty and filthy and yeah and yeah. whatever. So did your mindset have to change or did Oh very much so. Yeah. And how did you cope with that? Fairly well. Fairly well. Fairly yeah. well, yeah. I mean you're still in a service, you still realise that they you know, a job's gotta be done. And once you get to know the job, then it's easy. I mean, anything's easy once you get to know. Mm. Um, taught me a lot about log cards because up till then it was just a question of, yeah, all right, it's a log card. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, I'll admit to being a bit naughty when it came to log cards. Um, and you talk about log cards. Is this is this for the vehicle? So for the aircraft with like well, yeah, flying I mean, out? Uh, the, the blades, the gearboxes, um, batteries, oleos. Um, I mean, everything's got a log card. Okay. It's got a serial number. You know when you put it on. You know when it's come off, when it's been serviced. I mean, it's a history of the of that particular piece. Right. So not not as a one individual aircraft. It's oh, no. an individual part. Oh, yeah, yeah. Wow. Very much okay. so. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, interesting. And uh, until I actually sort of got there, um, I was a bit naughty with log cards. But then you saw it from the other side. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and when all of a, yeah, when all of a sudden they're necessary and you think, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> I shouldn't have done that. Did you have to explain to certain people, like, this needs to be done a better way. <laughs> this needs well, to be filled out properly. Well, yes. I mean, but basically it was a question of being able to turn around. Uh, I mean, there were a couple of times when I turned around to the people in the hangar and sort of saying, you know, where's the lock card for so-and-so? Oh, it must have got lost. Oh, well, in which case, change the blade again. <laughs> Well, we can't. Yes, you can, because I haven't got a log card. Therefore, you don't know how much time that aircraft yeah. or that gearbox has done or whatever. Um, the the policy's changed now. Um, the policy used to be uh, everything had a life. Now there's an awful lot of things that are allowed to go until they break. Okay. Unless they are detrimental to the aeroplane's life, e.g. like a blade... Uh, I mean, you can't suddenly have a um, helicopter rotor blade suddenly go, no, no. you know, because it falls out of the sky. Um, but th things that um, things that really are, not, okay, the word isn't superfluous, but... Like a, like a battery. Yeah. So like if yeah, that... I mean, if a battery sort of goes pear-shaped, then it really doesn't matter because you've got two generators going yeah. and therefore you're still giving it um, electricity to the aircraft. That makes sense. So, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, cool. Now you've you've mentioned uh, aircraft as a helicopter. Is that the terminology used for? Well, they're all aircraft. They're all aircraft. Yeah. I mean, okay. there's a difference between an aeroplane, uh, which the rotary wing call planks, because it's literally sort of a wing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that the rotary wing sort of call us planks. Um, choppers. Uh, is the is the word for fixed wing aircraft or fixed wing maintenance, if you like, that they derogatory call helicopters. Okay, it's like calling the army pongos. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's just one of those things that happens. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's nothing behind it. It's just friendly rival. Yeah, yeah. Now moving on with your career. Yeah. Um, how long was you there for at Odium? Well, I came out of End Jobs. End Jobs. That's, 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 End that's... Records. I came out of End Records. Yeah. And I went into ASF. Within Odium. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Um, that that was me back on my, you know, working on aircraft. So I'm, okay. I, I'm sort of a happy bunny. Still a sergeant. Yeah, still a sergeant. Yeah. Okay. Um, I made it up to chief then, and got moved to Pumas. Right. Off Wessex onto Pumas. Um, a claim to fame. Now this sounds as if I'm going to blow my own trumpet. Um, when I took over the um, Puma team, Puma Major team, it was putting aircraft out something in the region of 18 to 20 weeks late. Um, I can't remember the timings now, but you've got something like about 44 days to do a Puma Major. I think it's 44. It doesn't matter. Um, and they, because of the, their type of work and the chief they had before them, they were putting it out sort of something in the region of... Um, they were putting it out late, which cocked everything else up down the line because there was aircraft running out of hours that needed to come in and they weren't able to, so they were having to extend that life. Awful lot of work. So I was put in charge of the Puma team and I went in there at about half past six the first morning, sorted all the paperwork out. It was a brand new aircraft. It was coming in that morning. 
I sorted all the aircraft out. Um, the first guy came in. Um, I introduced myself. Uh, I asked who he was. And I said, right, there's your paperwork. Get on with it. And he looked at me and he went, but this is for the tail rotor. And I went, yeah, and? And he said, well, I don't do tail rotors. He says, I do the undercarriage. And I said, I'm sorry? You do what? He says, I've only ever worked on the undercarriage. Oh, well, no wonder you're going out bloody late. Yeah. Because <laughs> the moment you go on leave or you're sick, yeah. there's nobody to work on the undercarriage. Yeah. So when the guy who normally did the tail rotor came in, I then turned around and said, work together. You teach him about undercarriages, you teach him about the tail rotor. I don't want you to do the job. I want you to show him how. Basically, you work from the paperwork, but if you get into a muddle, ask the other guy. And I did this throughout. After about seven aircraft, we were back on putting aircraft out on time. Now, I I know that sounds as if I'm blowing my own trumpet, um, but it's not. It's the guys who worked. It's the team. I only led them. I showed them the road. They went down the road and they worked bloody hard. But they were doing, you know, before I took over, they were doing all sorts of uh, overtime. They were doing weekends. I don't work weekends. I'm not paid, to, well, at least I am paid. But <laughs> in theory, I don't do weekends. <laughs> Fair enough. And they were the same uh, role. They were the same technician role, but they had yeah, yeah. been trained on one area. Yeah. So that, so that a failing of, like, the... Training aspects. Do you well, think? It, it's the, it's the in my opinion. I mean, one of the things that uh, when I joined was the fact there was a multitude of aeroplanes and uh, many many places to go and service them. Mm. PG Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, Gan, five five or six stations in the Middle East. There was Belize. You know, mm. we, we were all over the world. Yeah, um, and a multitude of aeroplanes. I mean, Hercules, BC tens. Argus's, um, I mean, I started off on Varsity's twin engine V bomber. Wow. Theoretically. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, um, we had a diversity of aeroplanes. That's all gone now. We still have a certain diversity, but the number of aircraft we've got now, uh, types of aircraft we've got now, has diminished quite substantially. And the number of places you can go has also sort of been knocked on the head. Mm hmm. So when, when you're there looking after Puma, you mentioned it was an introdu introduction of that aircraft. Uh, it was new. Oh, yeah. So what did, what did you think of it, of this new new vehicle? It was a lot easier than the Wessex to play with. Yeah. Um, Size-wise, what are they compared to each other? Very much. Very much. I mean, similar? The, or? the Puma is a, it's a French aircraft. Um, it's very slightly smaller than the Wessex. Okay. Um, but then it's a, of a different era. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the Westwick sort of, I can't remember when it was first flown, but something in the read about 1948, 1949, the Puma is only about 10 years old. So, mm. you know, th it's, it's, it's just a different experience. Yeah. A lot easier to rig because you've got uh, a vernier scale up on the, each blade and you know what it's supposed to do. So, therefore, you can actually adjust it finally. With the Westwick, it's a question of, adjust that nut over there and adjust that nut over there no that's put that one out so you had to go ah. okay so that was more about experience and yeah. then the, the puma is more technical yes technically very advanced much so. therefore yeah. maybe yeah made it easier once you got on top of the uh personnel knowing all parts of yeah no that's fine <laughs> i mean they worked they worked yeah. bloody hard they were good <clears throat> so how much time was you there before you moved away from odium um, Odium in, was in, in that about, part that you're working on. I joined Odium in '76 and I got out of it at, in '80. In '80, okay. Uh, and went to Maraman Jobs. Right, but how long was you there for as a chief? Because you said you you got well, your chief technician. Is that right? Yeah, chief technician. Two two things happened. Uh, one funny, one one just thumbs up really. Um, the wing commander came in one morning and said. No, he didn't. He went to the flight sergeant first. Uh, the flight sergeant brought him to me and he said, what are you doing about so-and-so? I said, I haven't the faintest idea. And the flight sergeant turned around to me and he said, oh, come on, chief, you know, you ought to know. And I went, hold on. I know a man who does. And I called over my call. Ben, his name was. And I said, Ben, tell the wing commander what we're doing about so-and-so. 
And the flight sergeant took me away to one side. He said, if you'd have done the course, you'd have been able to answer the wing commander. I said, yeah, and if I'd have done the course, I'd be here a bloody sight longer. I want out of uh, here in three years. I don't want to do five. <laughs> okay. Because once you've done a course on an aeroplane, okay. you are then stuck on that aeroplane for five years. There's no way out. Right. You, right. Pay, you pay back what they've given to you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I kept on refusing to do the course. For that reason. <laughs> For that reason. Oh, yeah. yeah. I don't like helicopters. I never yeah. have. Okay, okay. Fun to ride in. Um, fun to be with, actually. Um, there was a time at Goodersloe. We were out on exercise. And this guy, Schultz, he was a crewman. Um, and he said, um, oh, give us a drink of your Coke. And I went, I was on guard, theoretically. Uh, no, you don't want a drink of my Coke. He said, ding on Give us a drink. And I went, Schultz, you don't want, really want a drink of my Coke. And he said, oh, give us it here. And he took a slug. He said, Christ, you've got Bacardi in there. And I went, yeah, I did say you didn't want to. <laughs> he said, you bastard. <laughs> so, yeah, I got away with that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you said there was a story from Odin with a thumbs up. Yeah. Um, the No, that was the thumbs up. The one, the oh. wing commander when I called Ben over. The one where I can actually go a thumbs Knows there was a opposite me on another Puma team was a guy called Pops. I can't remember his surname, it doesn't matter, but he had white hair. Um, he talked very quietly. Um, he got everything done exactly the same way as I did, but he was very calmly and very quietly spoken. I am a noisy bugger, I shout, I rave, I scream at people. Um, the squad leader's surface is up on the balcony just behind my aircraft. And he came down one morning and he said, why can't you be more like Pops? <laughs> and I looked at him I said, let's get one thing straight. My hair's brown, Pops is white. I wear glasses, he doesn't. He weighs only about eight stone. I'm 12. I'm noisy, he's not. There is no way I can be like Pops. <laughs> and he said, I give up. I said, oh, good. And with that, he toddled <laughs> off. <laughs> oh, funny, funny. <laughs> 